just to kind of uh, remember this is chapter 1, the opening verses of chapter 1, the first 19 verses. Uh, we're all about uh, uh, the riches that are ours in Christ Jesus. And uh, so we said it was, it's like a, a, a master card that you can go to an ATM machine, but this is the master's card uh, with which we can access uh, the riches that are ours in, uh, in Christ Jesus. Our next section of chapter 1, uh, the last half was th this idea of because of our relationship uh, with Christ Jesus, uh, Paul says we have the same power that's in us that raised Christ from the dead. Uh, but it's a relationship. We literally, like that extension cord, we need to stay plugged in. We're not ever ready batteries where we just come occasionally <laughs> to the Lord uh, and get a recharge. Uh, we just want to stay plugged in and uh, spend time with the Lord each, uh, each and every day and access the power that's ours in Christ. And then uh, uh, I won't repeat the joke that went with this uh, for fear of somebody uh, throwing something at me. But uh, it was corny, but it made the point. But we're, we're shaved by grace. We're saved by grace. And uh, if you didn't hear the joke, you can uh, ask somebody uh, afterwards. So uh, this is where we're at today. Uh, this section here is, and that's the title of the message, uh, The Peace, uh, Peace of God. Again, chapter 2, the opening 10 verses were uh, all about our relationship that is based on grace. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Um, it's not of works so that no one can boast. The gift is God's grace to us. Our part is placing our faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that was the opening 10 verses uh, of chapter 10. Uh, now he comes to this section of the fact that this, uh, this new entity uh, here in the New Testament era, here in the first century, uh, called the church, are uh, this amazing group of people that are made up of Jews and Gentiles together. Uh, I think because we, uh, we're kind of used to the Bible stories, we're used to the New Testament and so forth, and we, uh, we don't really realize that the complete impact of uh, what a radical thing uh, this, this was. And Paul's going to certainly uh, describe it for us here. Uh, but just to give you a, a, a couple little tidbits of information. Uh, in the, by the first century, Jews believed that Gentiles were created for one purpose, so there'd be something to burn in hell. <laughs> you talk about, this is kind of two tough groups to try to get together here. Uh, it was unlawful, not according to God's law, but according to the, the traditions, the oral traditions. It was unlawful for a Jew to aid a Gentile woman in childbirth because you didn't want to bring another Gentile into the world. Uh, this goes on and on. And uh, uh, these are two groups of people about as uh, diverse and, and uh, in opposites uh, as you could be. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans were not any better. Uh, the Greeks uh, and the Romans uh, believed that uh, all other people besides themselves were just babblers. And they just kind of said that word and it came out barbarians. Uh, and that's the way they, uh, they looked at them. The Roman uh, Levy confirmed this in his day saying that the the Greeks wage a truceless war against people of other races, against uh, barbarians. And, of course, then you had the uh, imperialistic uh, Roman uh, government and empire and so forth. So uh, these are two uh, groups of people uh, that uh, you would say, how in the world can they come together in one entity, in one group, and literally love one another? And it's only through Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul begins in the first uh, couple of verses here in verses 11 and 12, talking about and really addressing uh, Gentiles. So uh, again, the, the church in Ephesus, we studied it uh, in, uh, in our studies in Acts. Uh, it, it is the epicenter of the occult. Uh, the temple of Diana or Artemis uh, is there and so forth. There's a great riot. Remember when Paul is preaching the gospel and so many people come to faith in Christ, it's beginning to affect the guys that make the idols and sell them there uh, on the streets uh, of Ephesus. Uh, and uh, it is an amazing thing that's going on. And apparently this church, certainly it had an uh, had aspect of Judaism in it in terms of uh, believers. Uh, but he addresses very quickly uh, Gentiles. Uh, and, uh, and so probably this particular church, uh, unlike the church at Rome and some of the others, was possibly made up of mostly Gentiles at, uh, at this juncture. Uh, so therefore, he's going to address us, them, uh, in verse 11 and 12, saying, before, before we are far away. That's the way I've titled this section. Verse 11 says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision, uh, again, Jews, made in the flesh by hands, 
that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So uh, fourfold, the way that we were separated, uh, did not have a relationship with God before Jesus Christ came. Uh, and the first one is obvious. Uh, before we were Christless. Yeah, again, no access to the Messiah. One time you were separate. we were separate from the Jews and we were separate from uh, Christ himself. Uh, again, it's a uh, spiritual alienation. And uh, uh, these two things are certainly tied together. The Jews were waiting for their Jewish Messiah to come. Uh, so the only way you could be waiting with them and come to know them is if you were a part of Judaism. If you were a part and away from Judaism, then you were a part and away from and could not come to know uh, a Jewish Messiah in terms of, of Jesus. Uh, he was their coming hope. Uh, they certainly uh, were anticipating and waiting for him in the first century, uh, but uh, they didn't really anticipate the idea that the gospel or this message of Jesus and his love and forgiveness would be, well, they thought for the whole world, but they didn't realize it would be for, for Gentiles that did not need to become Jewish first. Uh, and yet that was what was promised in the scriptures all along. Back in Genesis 12, 2, uh, again, Moses writing, talking about the very important covenant that God made with Abraham where he promises to him uh, and to his physical descendants, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. Uh, and here's where we come in. And in you, all the families of the earth uh, shall be blessed. The way that all the families of the earth are blessed through Abraham is through his physical descendant, who is the Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ. Again, through Abraham, the Messiah comes, becomes the blessing to all. Uh, Peter, when he preaches on the day of Pentecost, his very first sermon, uh, when 3,000 uh, men receive Jesus as, uh, as their Messiah, as the Christ, Acts 2.38, Peter says uh, to them, repent lest every one of you and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the, for the promise is to you and to your children. And here's another group of people. To all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So the, it was always there uh, that the message uh, of the gospel when the Messiah came. He would be for everyone, Jew and Gentile. Uh, and at, uh, at Pentecost, certainly, uh, it was uh, a very appropriate time for this to happen and for the church age to, uh, to begin. Uh, even on Pentecost, the, the high priest would be uh, in, the, in the temple, and it would be one of the times that uh, he would have a wave offering that was with bread that wasn't leavened. There would be two loaves that he would wave as an offering before the Lord. If you ask rabbis, why they did, or even why the, uh, if those today ask why they did, they, they have no idea. Uh, we would see in the symbolism that there were two loaves, there were two groups of people. There were Jews and there were Gentiles. They were brought before the Lord, and exactly that's what happens on the day of Pentecost. Uh, again, formerly, we Gentiles did not have access to God, therefore we did not have peace. But now we live in what's called, the Bible calls the time of the Gentiles. Uh, Jesus mentions it in Luke 21, 24, where he says, And Jerusalem, uh, he's predicting this is going to happen, and of course it did, uh, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are, are fulfilled. Now it's interesting that uh, uh, the Jews in, in, in a couple little time periods have been able to uh, recapture uh, Jerusalem once again completely uh, in terms of taking uh, control of the temple mount area and so forth. Uh, in the 1967 uh, war uh, for a few days after they recaptured it for the very first time, they were able to go to the Western Wall uh, and uh, they had been, uh, again, alienated from that special place where they met with God to worship God uh, since the days of the Ottoman Empire and were driven out by, by, by the Muslims uh, and, uh, and for about a thousand years really had no access. But after the, uh, they were attacked in 1967, 
and even though the uh, Jordan, which they had treaties with and were pretty had, had pretty good relationships with, uh, they said, don't, don't get into this with these other guys with Egypt and Syria and so forth and Iraq that were attacking him. But uh, Jordan entered in uh, and they controlled uh, all of East Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Uh, God blessed them the, uh, uh, and uh, against overwhelming odds once again took control, but only had control for a little period of time and relinquished that control of the Temple Mount uh, back to uh, the uh, Jordan and, uh, and let them control it because of the uh, Alaska Mosque and because the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the gold dome that's there, which are holy sites to, to Muslims, and they control it. We still are in the times of the Gentiles. Uh, we've come in. Uh, that city, in a sense, is still being, quote, trampled upon uh, until a future time. Paul says that future time will come when Israel will gain that control again. Romans 11, 11, he says, I say then, have they, the Jewish people, stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So uh, we, if you're a Gentile here today, we were separated from the Jews, Paul says, and it's, it's their Messiah that came and died for the sins of the world. If we were separated from them, it meant we were separated from uh, their Messiah. This is all part of the before. Uh, secondly, uh, so we were without a Messiah, and before uh, we were without citizenship, or stateless, we might say. He says we are excluded from citizenship uh, in Israel. And um, uh, this certainly was a, a big day uh, in, uh, in the first century uh, to the Ephesians that were, that were getting uh, this letter. Uh, it was very important what, what, uh, what, cit what city you belong to. Uh, people were generally very proud uh, of their culture and their city and so forth. Uh, and this idea to be alienated away from God's city, uh, God's state, and you can't be part of it was, uh, uh, was a, very, uh, a very big deal. Excluded from, uh, from citizenship. Uh, notice also that uh, before then we were friendless or we were alien uh, to the covenants, to the promises and so forth. Uh, God had brought promises to the nation of Israel, many of them unconditionally. Uh, but as Gentiles, we had no access uh, to them. We didn't know what God's word said. We didn't know what the promises were uh, excluded from uh, the promise. And then fourthly, uh, we were hopeless as well as godless. He says without hope, uh, without God in, in the world. Uh, again, there's that, that separation that brings uh, desperation uh, without God, without hope. Uh, and it's very interesting, again, in the first century, uh, uh, we don't normally think about it or read about it, but it was, uh, it was an era of suicide. Uh, it was an era in a time period where people were, uh, were very desperate. Uh, they come to realize that the Greek philosophies that sometimes come and go in terms of their popularity in our own culture uh, were empty. Their uh, basic traditions were disappearing. They were realizing that their, uh, their own religious systems were really uh, powerless to help them uh, in any, uh, any way in terms of life or, or death. Uh, and, uh, and it was a, a time where people were without hope. And that's what Paul is describing there. And certainly that's, that's the case with many, uh, many people today. Uh, Tacitus, a, a Roman historian, uh, talks of a man who, uh, uh, who kills himself uh, because of the indignation of his even being born. Uh, uh, socialist Darwinist uh, Herbert Spencer wrote, wrote this. This whole idea of can man really live without a legitimate and a valid purpose for his own, his own life? He wrote, my own feelings respecting the ultimate mystery is such that I cannot even try to think of it without some feeling of terror so that I habitually shun away from the thought. I don't even want to think about an afterlife. I don't even want to think about where there is a God and whether I will face him one day. I don't want to think about those future things. It's too terrible for me to consider. Uh, and there's a lot of people that have come to that conclusion. Well, some very, very bright and intelligent people in our, in our own day, day and age. Uh, Viktor Frankl, I, I want to read a quote from him, but you kind of need to little know about him. Uh, he's, uh, he was a, uh, really a, a prominent psychologist uh, in his day. He develops a, a theory called logotherapy. <laughs> I was kind of looking for Pastor Kev, a psych major, as if he had to study about Viktor Frankl. Uh, but he writes a, a very interesting book about the, uh, uh, the meaning of, of life. And uh, in which he uh, he basically uh, uh, is uh, is a, a unique guy because he's Jewish uh, and he's arrested and he goes to the Holocaust. 
Uh, he's got the manuscript uh, of his thesis sewn into the lining uh, of his jacket. Uh, and uh, of course, as he enters Auschwitz, then uh, that jacket and his, quote, life's work is, uh, is taken away from him. This life work about, is there real meaning to life? Uh, he says that, uh, I find myself confronted with the question of whether under such circumstances my life was ultimately void of, uh, of any meaning. He's, he goes on and says, I had to surrender my clothes and in turn inherited uh, worn out rags of an inmate who had been sent to the gas chamber. Uh, he said, instead of the many pages of my manuscript, I found in my pocket a newly acquired coat with a single page out of the Hebrew prayer book uh, that, uh, that had the simple Jewish prayer, the Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord uh, thy God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, uh, and with all your, all your might. Uh, he, he survives the Holocaust, uh, obviously. Uh, and then he ends up writing this uh, in his book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. And I think I have the quote for you. Uh, there is nothing in the world that would so effectively help one to survive even the worst conditions as the knowledge that there is a meaning in one's life. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. And, uh, and certainly we've seen that in the lives of others who have suffered and gone through horrific experiences like Viktor Frankl. Uh, the why. Uh, in the first century, as in our day, uh, we were, they were, Gentiles, separated, separated from God's people, God's word, God's Messiah, uh, without hope, without real meaning uh, in, uh, in this life. Again, Paul's describing uh, this incredible thing that happens uh, as, the, uh, as the church is born, uh, Jews and Gentiles coming together because we have peace with God. This word uh, alienation that he uses here uh, is, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, and we would say uh, it is the root and the root problem of, well, what it was in that day and these two groups of people coming together as it is in our day as well, we call it racism. It's the root of it, this alienation away from God, away from meaning and purpose in life, away from God's love, uh, therefore not having a love for others. Uh, it's a problem in, uh, in their day. Certainly it continues to be a problem uh, in our day. And we saw that flare up in the news uh, just about six months ago in terms of the riots that were in Ferguson, later in New York, and carried out through uh, other major, major cities. Pra praise God, it's, it's not that kind of an issue here uh, in the islands. We, we are super blessed uh, in that way. Uh, but I came across uh, an article that just came out in Decision Magazine. Uh, it just hit my desk a few days ago. Uh, and in it, it was talking about uh, uh, the work of Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, and, uh, in 1965. Uh, when he walks 54 miles uh, to the steps of, of the Capitol uh, and, uh, and deliver his, uh, his famous uh, speech that we're familiar with. It was in 1965 that the Voting Rights Act was passed. It was in 1964 that the Civil Rights uh, Act uh, was, was passed. Uh, both uh, uh, great victories for the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, interesting, though, the behind the scenes. Uh, during that time, even though those things were passed legislatively, uh, Government officials like our president at the time and our vice president at the time knew that it wasn't enough. Hubert Humphrey, uh, again a Democrat, made a request of Dr. Billy Graham. And he said this, quote, uh, Billy, this bill will never really be implemented unless it, it comes from here. And he pointed to his heart. Then he told Mr. Graham, uh, this is the job of you and the church to help bring about love in the heart of people. Uh, and then President Lyndon Johnson asked Dr. Graham if he would go, cancel his plans to go to Europe and go into the South and carry out crusades, gospel crusades, and preach the gospel. If these laws were ever going to be implemented, uh, the root of racism had to be uh, eliminated. They believed the only way it could be, the way Paul says here, uh, is if the alienation from God is removed. Man needs a change of heart, not just simply a, a re-education or, or a better job. Uh, and uh, Billy Graham says this about that uh, a conversation that he had with uh, Dr. King uh, before a prayer meeting, before a crusade in New York, uh, just a few years later when we'd kind of come to the other side of some of these things. Uh, and Billy says, uh, he urged me to keep on doing what I was doing, uh, preaching the gospel to integrated audiences and supporting his goal by example 
and not to join him in the streets. And then three years later, Dr. King had said to him, uh, had it not been for the ministry of my good friend, uh, Dr. Billy Graham, my own work in the civil rights movement would not have been as successful as it, would have, as it has been. Uh, the problem is our heart and the heart condition, an alienation, a separation from God, no peace from God. Therefore, it's really hard to have peace with others around us. And what happens in the first century in terms of the forming of this thing called the church that's got Jews and Gentiles in it together is an amazing thing because these are two groups of people that would have never, never apart from Christ, ever, ever come together for uh, uh, any reason whatsoever. They go from despising each other to having a tremendous love uh, one for another, willing to give up their lives for each other. Paul says, before we were far away, we are far away from the Jewish people, therefore we are far away from God. I am their Messiah. We were alienated. But uh, he says in verse 13 to 15, but Jesus has become our peace. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, who has made uh, both one. It has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God and in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, this war that had gone on. And verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, to those who were near, for through him we both, Jews and Gentiles have access by one spirit to the Father. So we've both been brought near. Uh, it took the blood of Jesus Christ to regenerate our hearts. Uh, and because of that, uh, we say first that we, uh, Jesus became our peace and ended the separation. Uh, and there's two kinds of separation. One was, uh, one was a literal separation. Uh, again, if you were, you were a Gentile and you went with your Jewish friend to find out more about his religion and you went to the temple, you could go up to the temple mount, uh, but you could only go so far because there was a barrier there and you could go no farther. You could go into what we'd call the court of the, of the women. A lot of training and teaching and so forth uh, went on there. And then, of course, the women couldn't go any further than to the court of the men. And, of course, the men couldn't go any further when they came to the, the court of the priest. And then the priest couldn't go any further uh, than the veil that separated the Holy of Holies because only the high priest could go there and only uh, on uh, one day of year on uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But Jesus came and ended a, a literal separation. Uh, there was a sign over that wall that said this, and uh, uh, we've actually got uh, a few of these from uh, an archeological dig from 1871 and one from 1934, uh, and uh, in which uh, I read, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death, called the Thanatos, the inscription uh, that's there. Well, there's no temple in Israel today, but there's still, there's still a separation. And uh, I've got a little slide for you. So, uh, so you can see the little barrier that's there. Uh, if you can see from the large menorah to the right, there's a woman there. Uh, and you can see a guy with his hand up on the wall. There's even a separation from men and women today. There are still literal se separations that are there. Uh, and this is the Western Wall, sometimes referred to as the, the Wailing Wall. Uh, it's the Western Wall. It's, it's, the, it's the best thing they've got. It's the closest thing they've got that they can get to in terms of the, uh, the temple itself. And so it's a, uh, it's a place they like to go to prayer. Uh, I have uh, just one more shot, one of my favorite pictures there. Me and my big brother with our kippahs on and praying at the, the Western Wall. And there was a gal on the tour with us that had a camera exactly like mine. So I gave my camera to her because she can't come into, right, the court of the men. Uh, I said, hey, here's my camera. I know you know how to use it. It's just like yours. Shoot a bunch of pictures. I got to get a picture of my, my brother and I praying at the Western Wall, one of my favorite pictures. There's still a literal separation there, there today, a literal se separation. Uh, and uh, it was there in, uh, in the day of Paul. Uh, the, it's there without a temple uh, today. But there was also a legal separation. Uh, and uh, that was the barrier of the commandments. 600, 613 uh, laws or rules of, of the Torah. 
Uh, and of course, most Gentiles would not even try to keep those laws because we were separated to start with. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that separation is ended through Jesus Christ. Paul says, but Jesus himself uh, is our peace. Sometimes referred to, therefore, as the peacemaker. He has made peace between, between the Godhead and us. Uh, in the Greek, it's he himself. It's, uh, it's very emphatic. It's not something we've done. Uh, it's something that God has done on our behalf. Uh, he's become our peace. He did it, Paul says, by his sacrifice. The solution was intellectual, political, or social. Uh, it, was, uh, it was spiritual. Those walls were torn down. And literally, as you know, uh, the veil in the temple, that one separation from God's presence uh, to where the people were, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom when Jesus uh, died on the cross. Uh, he ended the separation by three ways. One, he abolishes the law, verse 15. Having it abolished in his flesh the enmity, the separation, the war, that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. Nobody could keep the 613 laws anyway. Remember when they were trying to figure out in Acts 15 what to do with all the Gentile converts? So, uh, Peter jumps up and says, well, I don't think we should ask them to do what we're trying to do because we're not too good at it ourselves, if you haven't noticed, my paraphrase. Uh, uh, none of us are really great at keeping all these laws. I don't think we want to put this burden on them as well. Nobody really could, could keep it. Uh, he abolished the law, those requirements uh, in his flesh. Uh, now, in terms of reconciling this from Matthew 5, uh, 17, uh, is important because there Jesus said, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. And that's what Jesus did. He is the one guy that showed up and perfectly kept all of the law, everything re required of him. The sacrificial, the moral, uh, he, kept, he kept it all. He's the only person to live that perfect, sinless life. Uh, he did, in fact, fulfill it. And that way he did not come uh, to destroy it. The word abolish in verse 15, though, uh, does not mean to annihilate. It just means to render powerless. Because the law had a power over us before. Uh, and as Paul says, it was our schoolmaster to take us to Christ. Sometimes some, you, you may have had somebody share with you the Ten Commandments before you came to faith in Christ and, and just run, run through them. You know, thou shalt not, thou shalt not steal. Uh, have you have you ever even like taken a paper clip from work? Well, yeah, Corey, everybody's a little, yeah. Okay, now we've established the fact that you're a thief. Let's just move on. You know, have you ever even, thou shall not lie. Have you ever told a lie? Uh, I mean, in your whole life, well, you, you, not everybody tells them, you know. that. Okay, we've established that you're a thief and a liar. Let's get, now, like, now keep explaining. And you move through the law, of course. And then now explain to me that first statement you made about how, you think you're going to be good enough somehow to get to heaven and please God because you're a thief, you're a liar, you're, you know, you can go on down. The, that's what the law does. Uh, it, uh, it exposes our, our, our sin. It was, never, it was never meant to make us righteous. It was to show us we had a need for righteous. And um, McDonald's is trying to ruin my illustration on this, but I've, uh, I've said for, for, for years that people don't go to McDonald's to, to get healthy. Uh, you... you you probably need a little counseling on that if uh, you think that's a, a good idea. Now they got salads and stuff, they got yogurt, so they're they're killing my illustration. But uh, uh, the idea is that it was never meant. It was never. They didn't start McDonald's thinking this is going to be an awesome kind of a health food place we're doing. No, it was supposed to be cheap. It was supposed to be fast, and it was supposed to be clean. And uh, uh, and people like that, uh, and they go there. But it's not because they're they're uh, vegans or anything. Uh, uh, it was never its intention. The, it was never the intention of God that the law would make us righteous. It would show us our need for a Savior who can make us uh, righteous. Uh, and Jesus has done that for us. Second, or thirdly, he became our peace, and it was for a purpose. Verse 15, again, uh, having abolished in his, in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, here's the purpose, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, uh, thus making a peace. The... Um, uh, Alexander, uh, Clement of Alexander wrote in the second century, uh, we who worship God in a new way as the third race are Christians. And the uh, epistle of uh, Diogenes uh, calls new believers the, the new race. Uh, something that very uh, uh, incredible happens when uh, these Gentiles in Ephesus, along with their Jewish brothers, have come to faith in Christ. Paul says they become an entirely new man. 
Uh, that's why he would state earlier in chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, uh, something new. The hymn writer would put it this way, in Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. Uh, it's, and it is an amazing thing that wherever you go, and we had uh, some folks here from um, California last week, and we uh, had a couple here from, from uh, Canada and so forth, uh, and, uh, and it's fun uh, to have the visitors, especially if they're part of a Calvary Chapel somewhere, because they all pretty much say the same thing. You know, it's really amazing. You know, we're just here visiting. We saw your sign and thought, hey, let's go check it out. And he says, they say, I can't tell you how we just feel so at home here. Uh, I said, hey, we, we get that in China. You know, if it's a Calvary Chapel, we just walk in and there's just, it's just uh, in, in an incredible thing. This idea that uh, 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 Jews don't need to become Gentile. Gentiles don't need to become Jews. Uh, we are created as one new, new man. So I'm thinking of, you know, the church name, New Man Christian Fellowship. We're, we're, I'm just, I had another suggestion, just simply, uh, if we're changing, just the best. I always thought that would be a good name for the church. What's the name of the, which, where do you go to church? The best church. But, um, how do you know it's the best? It says so on the side. The best church. <laughs> Newman Christian Fellowship. We're a new race of, of people because he gives us purpose uh, because of his peace, reconciling Jews and Gentiles together because God went to the cross for us, uh, ending, therefore, the hostility uh, with God and mankind. Uh, then he became our peace and uh, and brought access. Uh, he came and preached peace. Isaiah prophesied about his being a peacemaker. Isaiah 9, 6, something we see uh, at Christmas on cards sometimes. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, Jesus gives uh, peace uh, to a world that, well, we kind of need it, don't we? Uh, and even with the best, the best efforts and the, and the best intentions, uh, it just, uh, I think we kind of come to realize it's really not going to happen until Jesus literally comes back and uh, brings peace to this, uh, this earth. I got, a, I got a kick out of the story, and I, I kept it. Uh, in 1986, there was, because uh, I'm a 60s guy, uh, there was a peace march, uh, 1986. These guys were a couple de decades late for the parade. But uh, nonetheless, they're probably older hippies. Uh, and uh, they wanted to have a peace march uh, to, uh, from L.A. Uh, and, the, but, uh, uh, and they were going to work their way up uh, uh, toward Northern California. Uh, they got 120, uh, and there was 1,200 people uh, involved uh, in the peace march. Uh, it stalled in Barstow, 120 miles out of L.A., because uh, uh, fighting and bickering broke out, you know, among among the marchers as they were as they were going along, which you know, unfortunate for a peace march. Uh, and then uh, they they started fighting over uh, dress codes uh, and who was really marching and who wasn't, because it turned out some of the people were actually kind of riding along in cars, and then the people that weren't riding didn't really didn't really like that. So they decided, you know, we have to have some organization. So the whole the whole peace march stopped at that point. Uh, we're going to have an election. Uh, but they couldn't decide on who would be allowed to vote and who wouldn't because some people aren't really walking a after all. They're not really marching. Uh, and, uh, and then they had an election anyway, but then a lot of people decided the election was invalid, uh, and so uh, most of the people just uh, left at that point. Uh, it didn't make it too far. Uh, and certainly we see it uh, in, in, a, in a more horrific scale uh, in the Middle East and around the world, uh, uh, the desperation for, uh, for peace. Uh, and it only comes through Jesus Christ. Uh, and it will only come to this earth when the Prince of Peace, as Isaiah predicted, uh, when the government is resting on his shoulders and he really establishes uh, his kingdom, uh, even with the best of efforts. As we get to verse 19 to uh, 22, we're saying we're being built then into God's house. And Paul will, uh, well, Paul didn't take freshman English, so he's going to mix his metaphors here. He's going to say that we're like a city. Then he's going to say we're like a family. And then he's going to say we're like a great uh, building. Uh, verse 19, now therefore uh, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints uh, and members of uh, the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together 
for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So first the city, then a family, and then the, the building. So the church here, uh, this uh, incredible thing that's come about. Uh, people, no matter, no matter what their socioeconomic background, no matter what their racial background, remember the church uh, was, uh, if it was made up of one thing predominantly, it was slaves who'd come to faith uh, in Christ. Uh, they didn't live with a lot of hope, and they were pretty open to the gospel. And, uh, but you also had uh, people of Caesar's household, we know as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite, quite the range in terms of socioeconomical background and this whole thing of Jews and Gentiles together, people that were part of the Roman world. It's an amazing thing. Uh, and Paul says uh, we're compared to a city uh, that's being, uh, being built. Uh, he says you're fellow citizens now, uh, and uh, you join, uh, join together. And... Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that um, I, uh, uh, when Kat, Kathy and I had a chance to go to Washington, D.C. a few years ago, we were back there for an FRC conference, and we went ahead, because we'd never been to the Capitol, and we, uh, we got our rail pass, and Fred and Carolyn, who are from, you know, the area, were here and part of the church, so they, we got everything all uh, checked out with them and how to get around and, and all, and uh, uh, we walked our, our little legs off, uh, seeing as many monuments and museums as we possibly could. And the museums are in, incredible, and we're kind of... You know, if we're in a big city, I'm going to find a museum, you know, kind of, kind of person anyway. And uh, so I was like a kid in a candy store. And, uh, uh, but then the, the monuments are, are, are amazing uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I have to tell you, just, just walking into the Lincoln Monument uh, is very, it's a very interesting experience. And to stand on those steps where Martin Luther King stood and just look and think about the history of the place, uh, to walk inside and then you read on one wall, uh, a quote from uh, one of his uh, inaugural ad addresses. Uh, on the other side is a portion of the uh, Gettys Gettysburg Address. Uh, and people are, you know, there's lots of people coming in. And they all come in and do the same thing. They're kind of talking and, that, and they start reading and all of a sudden they're quiet. And then and a lot of them have a tear in their eyes before they, they leave that part of the chamber uh, and, go, and go see the other side. It's, it's very moving. And then we walked down and saw the Vietnam Memorial. Can, you know, can, uh, I think the Korean Memorial is on the other side. Uh, we walked on down and then came to the World War II uh, Memorial. And, uh, and, we, and it's beautiful. And, it, and it's, um, uh, it was only built a few years ago. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, you've probably heard about these honor trips where they fly in World War II veterans. Uh, and people sponsor them and fly with them and go with them because these guys are all in there and gals are all in their uh, 90s and so forth. Uh, and they get there and see the monument uh, built to, to them, the greatest generation. Uh, a time when the, uh, there was such <coughs> war, we were talking about it on Wednesday night. There were 100 million people in uniform fighting each other during, during that period of time against one of the great evils that's ever raised its head uh, uh, in terms of, of the world, world history, in terms of Nazism. Uh, and here's this memorial that most of these guys have never seen. And then sometimes you'll see one of them there, you know, a wheelchair and so forth. Very beautifully done, very, very moving. Uh, uh, and it, uh, it, it kind of breaks your heart, you know, makes you really want to pray, you know, for the, for the country. To think about the sacrifice that so many people have made to uh, institute our country and give us the freedoms that, that we have. Uh, all that to say is that uh, uh, the way I felt that day, that's the way these guys felt about Ephesus. That's the way people felt about their cities uh, in the first century. They were, they were very proud of them. Uh, and yet Paul comes along and says there's something better than that. Uh, there's a citizenship that's far greater than anything that you could ever experience uh, in, uh, in this life, in this world. It's a citizenship uh, of heaven itself. Uh, believing Jews and Gentiles had became a common people. They had a common language, one writer said. A language of the heart that they all understood. They had a common now, a common heritage as well as a common history they're part of a community of faith. They have a common allegiance uh, that supersedes all other loyalties. Uh, they had a common goal of glorifying God. Uh, they even had the same destination, a place prepared uh, by, by Christ, uh, as Jesus says uh, in John 14. Uh, trust in God, trust also in me. I, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be also where, where I am. Uh, Paul put it this way in terms of the citizenship and writing of the church there in Philippi uh, and uh, in Philippians 3.20 where he says, for our citizenship is in heaven uh, from which we 
also eagerly await uh, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body uh, that it may be uh, conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue uh, all things uh, to himself. Our citizenship is in heaven and we should be eagerly awaiting our Savior who's coming from, from there. Uh, he will transform uh, our lowly bodies uh, to something glorious uh, like his own resurrected body. Uh, he's able to do it because, by the way, he's the guy holding the whole universe in place right now. He's the one that spoke it all into existence. Uh, and one day we're going to be there uh, with him for all eternity. Uh, the church, secondly, is compared to uh, not just a city, but now a family uh, that's been brought together. He says we're members of God's household. We're, uh, we're, we're part of a, a family. We've been uh, reconciled to our Father. And that's how the Lord prayers, uh, begins. Uh, Jesus says, uh, pray like this, our Father who, who art uh, in, in heaven. Uh, later in chapter 3, verse 14, Paul would say this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is, uh, is named. Uh, when giving instructions to Timothy about uh, relationships in the church, uh, it's as a family. Uh, he tells Timothy, uh, uh, you know, treat, treat the older men as fathers. Uh, treat the younger men as brothers. Uh, treat the older women as mothers and treat the young and younger women as sisters. Uh, that's how we're to respect and treat one another because we're, we're part of this family, because of this reconciliation, because God's brought us peace, because that alienation is, uh, is no longer there. Uh, the third type that he uses, the third metaphor, is being built compared to that of a, of a temple. And, um, and again, uh, this is something that the Greeks were very... Uh, very familiar with uh, in terms of the temples. They, they had plenty of them, knew what their, uh, how beautiful and their splendor and the architecture and so forth. Uh, and certainly the, the Jews had Herod's temple at that time, very familiar with this uh, imagery uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, and Paul says this, uh, this temple has uh, uh, three, three parts to it. There is the foundation, uh, he mentions. Uh, again, uh, referred to as the, uh, the mystery of Christ that's now been revealed. Uh, through God's holy apostles and prophets. Now, interesting, again, these two tied together. Uh, the, the, the apostles and the prophets, uh, they are the ones that bring us the New Testament uh, scriptures. Uh, therefore, the foundation of the church is the New Testament. Uh, it is God's word to us. Everything is founded uh, on, on that uh, and what it says to us. Uh, if you want to uh, bring, bring the building down, mess with the foundation. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, it, it'll come tumbling down. And we've certainly have seen that historically, uh, the New Testament scriptures. Uh, that's why Paul tells Timothy to, to preach the word in season and, and out of season. The second aspect is the cornerstone, which is, uh, again, a type of Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, Isaiah 28, 16, we could read many references saying that when the Messiah came, he will be the chief cornerstone. There Isaiah predicts, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold... I lay in Zion, in Jerusalem, a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily or be, be dismayed. Uh, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Uh, again, when they built a building back then, they did not have little lasers and everything to, to line things up in terms of the foundation. Uh, what they did is they set in place the chief cornerstone. It had an exact right angle on it. It was perfectly level and flat on its surface. Uh, it would be anchored first, and then they would pull all their lines and all their levels off that one stone. If it's off, the rest of the building's going to be off. It had to be perfect. It had to be correct. And that's the illustration here. Jesus is that chief cornerstone of the church uh, uh, because of who he is, his perfect sinless life, uh, because he died on a Roman cross uh, for our sins and rose again. Uh, we can look to him. He is the chief cornerstone. Peter puts it this way in writing his, uh, his letter, uh, his first epistle in chapter 2, verse 4, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, and he was, but chosen by God and precious, you also 
as living stones are being built up uh, in a spiritual, uh, spiritual house. Uh, again, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Uh, we are the building blocks of that, uh, of that house, uh, you and I uh, together. So it's an amazing thing. Once far away, but we've been brought near. Once we had no access to God, uh, now we have access to God. Uh, and again, keep in mind that, that in the history of mankind, what has not happened is that uh, people had many, many, many religions and they worship many, many, many uh, kinds of gods. Uh, and, uh, and God is hoping that someday they can figure it out and make their way and figure out who he is and come to know him uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. It's been quite the opposite. Uh, all people groups around, around the planet, uh, about 98% of them all had the same belief system at one time, that there was one true God and he was the creator. Uh, if you go back to what we call their folk religion, before any, quote, world religions uh, enter in. For example, in uh, the Chinese, uh, one of the oldest civilizations in the world, uh, right, right there uh, with Judaism, uh, around for uh, about 2,000 years worshiping the one true God who was the creator. Uh, they have uh, the idea uh, that, uh, but there's been a problem. Man has been separated from him by, by sin. They all have a, a similar kind of, a, uh, of Noah and a flood story. Uh, and they know that there's a problem and somehow they need to be reconciled by, by God. And they hold that belief system until about 14 B.C. or 17 B.C. when, when Buddhism and Taoism enter, enters China. And then, and then they, then they kind of devolve into a different kind of belief system. Uh, so if you're Chinese and you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you've returned to the faith of your fathers, uh, we would say. And that's true of every ethnic group around the planet. Uh, man hasn't been evolving towards God. He's been devolving away from God and the one true God. Uh, but Jesus Christ comes on the scene and enters history uh, and proves through his miracles and thousands of healings that he does through his death and through his resurrection uh, that he truly can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. It's not a mystery. God's not up there going, well, I hope they figure this out. <laughs> you know, because uh, there could be many ways to come to know me and experience righteousness, because that is the key factor. Coming to faith in Christ is not an issue of morality. It's one of righteousness. Uh, I know uh, people that are in their religious systems, for example, Buddhism can be very moral people, wonderful people. But the problem is, Buddha could never find a way to make you righteous. I've been to a lot of Hindu temples in India. I've been to the Ganges where women throw their babies into the Ganges to try to satisfy uh, the fear brought upon them because of a Hindu god named Kali. And I've been to his temple as well and seen the blood sacrifices there. But those sacrifices and the blood of those animals cannot make them righteous. It doesn't matter if those women bend on their knees uh, before that altar where that animal's just been slayed and take that blood and put it up between their eyes. It doesn't make them righteous. Only the blood of God himself would be sufficient to save us from our sins. He's the only one that can bring us peace uh, and give us uh, a relationship with God uh, and uh, all eternity with him uh, in, in heaven.
Yeah. 